Hey everybody, Jochen Haydn here, and I'm back with the Desert Wolf vs. Weirway Ace Warren Pacific play by email campaign. This is the 25th of October 1942. This will be the first turn that I actually review live. Well, first time watching it. Let's see how it goes. Okay, here we go. October 25th, 1942. This is Desert Wolf vs. Weirway. Okay, we'll start with some Coast Watchers here. All right, let's see what we get for Naval. Mm. Okay, so no night bombing at all. PBY 5As did find something up near Nauru at night. I'm going to have to ask Desert Wolf to turn these uh, scroll speeds up a bit. This is <laughs> a little slow. Okay, so now we're into the daytime, and Coast Watchers are reporting some random ships in different places. Uh, this this intel is always a little sketchy. It's not always accurate. Okay, so no real naval activity this turn that we can see. We're going right into some air stuff. So our PBYs are now spotting or thinking they're finding stuff. And here we go into airstrikes for the AM phase. Okay, sweep over uh, Kuchong. This is Desert Wolf sweeping from Akiab, uh, just over his troops there. More of the same. Okay, we get some P-40s doing the same thing. Sounds like the Japanese are up to their uh, recon stuff. All those the cameras clicks are successful recon missions. Okay, it looks like we're always coming in with some Sonyas to bomb Baton. And from what I saw, when I was looking over the files before, Baton is really on its last legs. There's no supply there. So these guys are going to probably take some damage and it'll be hard for them to recover it. Right, some damage to the, uh, to the base. Uh, this is just going to keep them from building forts, but given that he basically has no supply, I don't know what, what kind of fort he'd be building anyway. Okay, another raid on Baton. More hits to the base. Okay, now we have a raid coming in to this hex here, which is blocking the troops that are trying to wake, walk their way up this way towards Chung King. This hex, from what I recall, has really good terrain on it, so I, I doubt these bombers will be that effective. And there you go. Basically, no losses despite good weather. Okay, another raid. Same thing, no real damage. Well, and we're back to Baton in the Philippines. More Sonyas coming in. This is a straight ground attack. Uh, they don't appear to be doing much damage today. Despite the low altitude. The weather was good. The altitude was low. But yeah, they're not really getting much done here. It, these, these bomb loads are like dropping rocks. Yeah, get some more. Same thing. No real losses there. Sonya's coming in here. And I suspect they'll do very little damage again because this is mountainous terrain up here. So, very little losses incurred here. Uh, the train is shielding the troops. Okay, another raid on Baton. And a raid on that hex there on the road towards Chung King. No losses. 
Wow, look at this. Whoa! Wow, look at the size of that raid. Guys, I'm playing in March of 1942, not October, so to even imagine a bombing raid this large, I can't even. It, it's it like, it's beyond my comprehension. This is the, definitely the biggest bombing raid I've ever seen in my short time playing this game. Look at this thing. I can't wait to see what kind of damage these guys can pull off. Look at this. Wow, they're coming at 5,000 feet too. They don't even care. What might help the Japanese here is the severe storms. All right, so this appeared to have been targeting the actual air base, not the ground troops. So these guys just kind of got caught up in it, right? But quite a bit of damage to the air base itself. Uh, this will stop fortification and burn supply. Oh my goodness, even more. Wow. That's so cool. I cannot wait to have... How does he get Dutch? Look at that. There's Dutch bombers in here too. He somehow got these guys bought out. I didn't know he could even do that. Huh. Alright, some more damage to the uh, air base. These appear to be going unchallenged too. I don't. There are another raid coming in. And what's it like to have this kind of bombing? All right. So on this raid, uh, one Blenheim four is destroyed by flak. Several other aircraft damaged. More hits to the runway. This thing's going to be mush after this turn. And there's more. Wow. God, I wish I could have but this kind of bombing. There's got to be nothing left of this base. Oh, man. I, if he's going this hard on here, he's got to be making a move towards Tongit. And, and some leftover stragglers coming in here. They don't really do anything. It's not much of a raid. Okay, we've got another raid coming in. Some B-25Cs. They don't really accomplish a whole lot there. This appears to be a sweep. Ah, but there's no opposition there. Another sweep. Yeah, he, With the amount of force that he's throwing into this, he's planning something at Tungi. <coughs> Okay, now was the AM phase. Now we're going to go into the PM phase. Or the afternoon phase. He's really be kind of Darwin, isn't he? The Japanese player. Okay, so it looks like we have a Japanese bombing raid coming in on the Cocos Islands. That don't really accomplish too much there. Bombing from very high altitude. Okay, so now the Japanese are counterpunching here, un unmolested by the American cap fighters. They don't appear to be in place. So this raid came in presumably from Pegu or Momine, hitting Mike Tilla.
definitely not nearly as much activity on the Japanese side as on the Allied side. Hard to know exactly why that is. Okay, so now we're going to see if there's in, nope, no real air transport that we can see. So that's it for the actual uh, air combat for this turn. So we're going to roll into ground combat now and see what happens. Oh! <gasps> oh! Dang, man! Look at the size of that thing! The scope and fires and hits, but the Mark 14 special. Dang, man. Did you see the size of that tanker? I think it was a monster. I wonder if that was one of those Tonin Whaler class, those huge things. Wow. What a bummer, dude. That was a big, big tanker, whatever that thing was. So the Sculpin's out here in the uh, Makassar Strait, uh, poaching on these tankers that are presumably coming in and out of Balak Poppin. There's a lot of oil here. He fires four torpedoes and gets a hit, but it is a dud because that's what American torpedoes do. They just ruin your day in a bad way for the American allied player, never for the Japanese. Damn, I feel bad for him. That's a bummer. That was a big tanker. Okay, here we go. Land combat phase. All right, so we got the Japanese up here doing a bombardment attack. We've seen this. Oh, I saw it in a previous turn. I didn't show it, but I saw it. Uh, he's definitely softening these guys up for an attack into Lan Chao. Uh, looking at what I see here right now, though, he, this guy, the Japanese, definitely don't have enough power to uh, unseat these ones. This terrain is times three, too, so he's going to have a hard time getting up into Lan Chao. So allies take some losses, but as you can see here, he does not have what it takes to push him out. This is probably the stacking limits really coming into play here. Okay, Japanese are bombarding Baton, and they're slowly going to whittle away the allied player here. I'm honestly incredibly shocked that Desert Wolf even exists on the Philippines in October of 1942. These guys are on their last legs, but they're still here. Again, I think it's the stacking limits that really contributed to this because the Japanese player can't bring in the overwhelming force they need. Uh, they don't have the force that they need. You need a three to four times advantage to unseat some of these hexes in here. And when you don't have it, it takes a lot longer. You gotta whittle away. So honestly, to me, the stacking limits favor the allies because we have the time and the Japanese don't. That's my opinion. You, you may disagree. The way I see it, the stacking limits definitely favor the allies in the long run. Uh, there you go. So this bombardment was pretty effective. Uh, squads that are destroyed don't come back. And this is just, just slowly whittling away these troops on Baton. We'll have to take a look at that when we analyze the turn. But he's in his death throes here. Okay, another bombardment attack here. We saw the Japanese player bomb this hex earlier. Uh, looking at what I see here, there's no way that these troops are ever going to bust through this hex with all these Chinese troops here. And these stacking limits really change stuff. Yeah, so this bombardment really didn't accomplish much. Oh, that's it. So no more ground combat this turn. I think this is... This is the point of campaign where we're going to really see the Japanese players struggle to make any more ground. Basically anywhere because it's it's so hard to to overwhelm the allied player in those hexes where you have really good terrain because you can't you can't put too many troops in there without taking severe penalties. So what do you do then? It's, it's hard. Alright, so now we're just in the last little bit. 
I think I'm going to go ahead and fast forward this until I can get Desert Wolf to speed this up a little bit for me. Because I don't have any control over how fast these messages come. So let's just get to the point here. So, okay. That's the end of it. Okay, here we go. This is the first turn that I'm doing for Desert Wolf. So let's take a look at the numbers like we do in mine. Okay, so aircraft losses for this turn. Pretty light, 3 to 1, and which I think is pretty remarkable given the amount of aircraft that were thrown at this. So the Japanese lose Jake, and the Allies lose two Catalinas of different varieties. These are probably Commonwealth. This is obviously a U.S. Navy. And one Blenheim 4 was shot down. That's really good considering how many aircraft were flying last turn. Look at the amount of sorties that were flown. 9,000 sorties. And out of 9,000 sorties, only three losses. It's pretty good. All right. So of those three aircraft that were lost, you have one wounded and one KIA pilot. Uh, looking at ships sunk last turn. No ships for either side. Our army loss points are going to be pretty mild this turn. Uh, there wasn't really any massive ground combat, just some bombardments. Yeah, so there you go. Um, no real change in the points this turn from what I can see. Hold steady at this ratio right here, which we'll take a look at at the end of this, um, end of this recap. I'm going to show you the tracker data for this particular campaign since we really haven't seen it yet. We'll take a look. Okay, so I've already reviewed the... Uh, combat report the SIGINT and the ops there was nothing really noteworthy in the combat report that we haven't already seen this turn uh, at SIGINT there was a couple interesting things so over here we see that a construction battalion is being moved on a Japanese AK to truck and also we know that the Kure second SNLF is at truck well, let's take a look at that so we know that he's moving more stuff there for what purpose I'm not entirely sure because looking at the port and the airfield capacity, this base is already built up as high as it's going to go. As high as you could possibly go. So maybe he's moving them to transport them to another location. Or maybe he's working on fortification levels now. I'm not entirely sure why he's moving a construction battalion to truck at this point. And we do know that at least the Kuris uh, SNLF is there. There could be more there. That's all we have SIGIN on. Alright. So cross that out now let's talk about the ops reports so i scrolled through the whole thing and there's obviously tons of sighting reports but there's a few things that i thought were interesting so looking at the bottom here we see that three heavy cruisers were repaired at pearl harbor and are ready for service so let's look at that show you what that is i've already got it sorted for just heavy cruisers so we're not spilling the beans on everything that's there but um from what i can tell it's going to be these new orleans classes they were upgraded so they weren't actually really damaged it looks to me that they were undergoing an upgrade which tracks because they have the 10 1942 mod we're in october and these uh, upgrades typically take about 20 days or so so it appears to me that he's moved these ships out here to have them upgraded at pearl so now they've got the latest radar suites the best aa they're going to have until 1944 basically so anti-aircraft is eh, okay but the radar is really good so that's what those ships were doing at pearl they were getting upgraded uh something else in the ops report that i noticed was that he's got a new cruiser mine layer at balboa let's take a look at this look at this thing the uh cruiser mine layer terror this seems like a very capable ship it's got decent range um really good speed not too bad AA, radar, and 150 mines. This is a very capable mine laying ship. It's almost a shame that the Americans get these so late. Because by the time that you're ready to deploy a mine laying ship, the Japanese are probably no longer offensive minded and they're not really going into hexes where you're going to lay the mines. So, I don't know. It's too bad that, you know, you don't get these mine layers earlier in the campaign when you really need them. All right, the last thing I noticed that he got this turn was these right here. This this is a new Kingfisher unit, and these are great for training pilots for the Americans. So as you can see, they're capable of training basically any important mission that you need. So if you want to train them on ASW, Naval Search, Recon, Sweep, you can do that too. Check it out. If you want to do Sweep, Recon, 
or sweep recon sweep now you can train these guys as fighter pilots you can train them as recon pilots search asw basically anything you want so these kingfisher units are really awesome for just getting your navy pilots spooled up any way you want and as you can see he's got a massive pool of kingfisher so he could in theory kit this thing out with 14 to start and another four in a week because you can only do a maximum of of 12 aircraft replacements per week per squadron but yeah always good to have these things that you can't have enough of them all right let's talk about the situation and just like i do in my videos we'll start on the ground so i have to look at this through an entirely different lens because there are stacking limits in this campaign so what does that mean well here's what stacking limits mean stacking limits are up here do you see this sl at the top Oh, can you see my mouse? Hold on. Right up here. SL, stacking limit. Each hex basically has a stacking limit, right? And that's pre-modded and determined by the players. Um, you cannot exceed the stacking limits or you start running into penalties for your troops. W so with that, you have a hex like here, for example, right? He's got 28,000 out of 30,000 troops allowed in the hex. The AV is about 746, right? But this terrain is mountain terrain. So it basically takes this AV value and the troop value and multiplies it by three. So he would have to bring 20, over 2000 AV to have any chance of eventually overcoming this, this unit, unless he bombed it incessantly and just really leveled it with bombers, right? Which is gonna be hard to do at this point. But he has the same stacking limits as the as the troops that he's attacking. So how is he going to get enough troops into this hex to really dislodge this unit? I don't think he can. Not easily. So this is why I feel that stacking limits, while they're very good and I get the idea of them and, I, and it changes everything, it makes it harder for the Japanese. Let me rephrase that. It makes it harder for anybody who's attacking to really overwhelm a hex. Because look here. Right? This is the other hex that we saw the Japanese bombing pretty decently last turn. WR is times three terrain. Um, Desert Wolf's got 1,800 AV in this hex, right? Multiply that by three, you're looking at 5,100 equivalent AV defending this hex. There's no way that the Japanese player with a stacking limit of 50,000 is going to get three times the amount of troops into this hex to uh, dislodge you. So, uh, definitely a difficult thing to do when you got stacking limits. You can't bring those depth stacks that you got to have. Um, that you, that you can enjoy in a game that doesn't have these. Just power through this, right? So, looking at this with that lens, what I'm looking at on the ground here is that the Japanese advance towards Lanchow is going to get severely hung up here at this hex. Their push into Chungking is going to get hung up right here and all through here. Right? See all that 1,400, 2,000 AV. He's going to have a heck of a time busting through all these places. And look at the train. Times three, times three, times three. Man, I don't envy this guy, the Japanese player, having to try to force away into Chungking that way. He's blocked here. He's blocked on multiple hexes here block there you know what i'm saying like this is this is tough for the japanese player when you have stacking limits and and desert wolf is doing everything he needs to do to cover himself in these hexes to have the best possible terrain to defend all right let's move on this turn we saw massive bombing on uh, what, what's this place called again tongi uh despite all that bombing for all those bombers it's only registering airfield damage of about 29 um, it could be because he's got a ton of engineers in this hex here. But it does seem obvious to me that what's what's happening here is that Desert Wolf is moving troops towards Tungi and he's trying to dislodge these guys here. But he's going to have the same issue here that the Japanese are having in China. Tungi is on Time Street terrain. On top of that, there's fortification levels more than likely at Tungi. So that's going to be hard for Desert Wolf to dislodge the Japanese out of this hex. 
Um, so this is the first campaign I've been playing where there's any kind of stacking limits. So I'm just as excited as you guys to see how this actually works. Uh, maybe it's hard, easier than I think to, to, to win ground combat, but to me it seems like it'd make it a lot harder. So let's watch and see. You know, maybe it's not as hard as I think, but looking at this, I see a lot of stalemates because you just can't bring the force you need into the hex to, to overpower an enemy without paying a penalty. And if you're curious about what the stacking limit penalties are, um, I can show you at the end of the video. I'll show you a, a, an excerpt from the manual that talks about them. All right. So that's Burma. Obviously, the Japanese control all the stuff in here. But we had a fun little encounter right here with the the Sculpin. They fired some torpedoes. They missed, unfortunately. But we also got to see what they had here. We know for a fact it wasn't this. So again, don't get caught up too much on, on this intel here. It may not always be accurate. Because what we saw in there was nothing like this. Unless this is an entirely new task force that's coming through. It was just basically tankers and a couple escorts. All right. The Japanese bombed out here at Cocos Islands. And quite honestly, I'm not quite sure what the play is here. So, yeah. Um, it looks like Desert Wolf has retreated a lot of troops that were in Java to the Cocos Islands. See, these are all ABDA. This looks like stuff that was previously on or near the Dutch East Indies. And now it's all just sitting here on the Cocos Islands, but I'm not quite sure what the purpose of the base is. It's not built up at all. Uh, it's just a sore, thumb, sore, sore thumb sticking out. So I'm not entirely sure what Desert Wolf is thinking by even keeping troops here. If anything, I guess all I can see is that um, he's pr not allowing the Japanese to take it. You know, he's just put some troops here just to hold it so they can't get a good some seaplanes out here. Because I'm sure that Desert Wolf probably wants these sea lanes open to move stuff north and south from basically India down to Australia. And we got this little guy out here. Not quite sure what this guy's got going on. I think it's just like a, a little... What do you call it? Um, A picket ship. It's just out here chilling. Making sure that Japanese aren't transiting through here. Wow, look at this. Oh, I see what he's doing. Okay, this is cool. He's got all these subs here, and they're actually doing sub transport. So that's how he's supplying Cocos Islands. He's using subs from Perth to bring supplies to Cocos Island. But it's a losing battle because they can't carry that much. And you need a lot of supply here, right? So they're just barely keeping these guys alive. But that's interesting use of subs my guess is that he's doing that because he knows that we're still in the phase of the war where the mark 14 torpedoes are any good so these subs are probably not going to do anything anyway they're just going to have a bunch of hits and misses with with that sort of thing so he's using these guys just to transport supplies okay i get it it's cool over here at baton we can get a better look at what's going on here so as you can see, the airfield, the base is completely wasted, right? With this damage, you'll never repair anything. Supplies are low. He has 2,000. Oh, no, I take that back. He has zero supply, 2,000 needed. So every day that this guy bombards and attacks, it's just going to chip away at these forces, right? Look at their disruption. If I were the Japanese player, I'd start actually attacking here. Because, I mean, with that AV being so low, supply is zero, disruption's high, fatigue is high. These guys are ripe for, ripe for the killing. We may have come in on this campaign right in time to see the death of Baton. So let's keep watching this, but we can see the Japanese are moving more troops here. They have a lot in there. I don't think it'll take a whole lot to, uh, to bust these guys out of Baton once and for all. But hey, that's just me. I'm new around here. Looking around Australia, pretty quiet, really quiet. Like all this part of the of the um, campaign is quiet. I don't even know if I'm even going to be looking at Australia that often going forward until we see something noteworthy going on there. To me, I feel like the war has left Australian waters at this point. And we're now kind of here in the Solomons looking at this. 
We don't really see a lot of activity except something going on at Tulagi, but we don't really know what. It says there's just uh, a midget sub, but I don't, I don't think that's what that is. Nothing going on down here at all, right? The war has left this area, but we do have some activity out here in the Gilbert Islands. So we saw that uh, it looks like this base is really starting to come up. Okay, he's working on the airfield here, and he's got a lot of engineers in place with what appears to be uh, maybe more on the way soon. Uh, I haven't really been tracking that, but he's just slowly building up these bases and working his way up the chain here. My guess is that the next place he'll be looking at is possibly Tarawa, which won't be fun to take. One nice thing is it looks like he's damaged Tarawa badly. The airfield damage and the port damage are so high that the Japanese can't build any more forts. I don't know what they got so far, but they're not going to get any more than what they've already gotten in here. Uh, Macon Island, same thing. He's keeping that nice and suppressed. So it looks like he's just going to slowly work his way at capturing one base at a time until he gets into the Marshall Islands, which are really um, lucrative for the American player because there's some good bases in here. And it's a great jumping off point for further attacks, especially towards Truck, which is the Japanese main base out here in the Caroline Islands. So uh, we'll keep an eye on the Gilbert Island campaign very closely in the following turns to see exactly what he comes up with. Okay, and I think the last area that we need to pay attention to is over here in the Aleutian Islands. I saw that there was some recon going on over here at Attu, and just like the Gilbert Islands, Desert Wolf is hammering Attu whenever possible. You notice that the airfield damage is very high. The Japanese will not be able to work on the fortification levels or, or even expanding the base until all that damage is repaired. So it does appear that there was some heavy damage done to this place earlier. Uh, my guess is that it was possibly due to a shore bombardment, maybe by some of these guys or something else. I'm not entirely sure. Something caused a lot of damage here. Remains to be seen exactly what it was, but we'll watch this as the turns go on. But he's probably going to start working his way through here and maybe over towards uh, Paramashiro afterwards. Again, I have no idea. Desert Wolf hasn't told me his plans, and I really don't want to know. I want to watch this campaign like you guys are and try to deduce what he's trying to do. Uh, and you never know. He may make an appearance every now and then and add some comments if he wants to because I know he trusts his opponent not to watch this campaign and to derive intel from it. Uh, he's got a great working relationship with Wearaway, and Wearaway doesn't need that stuff. He's been playing long enough. He doesn't need to watch YouTube videos to figure out what Desert Wolf's doing. So, all right, I think that's the turn here. I think I've talked long enough, but this was our first video, and I'm really excited to watch what happens here. Watching that bombing raid in Burma was like awe-inspiring to me because I'm in March 1942 in one of my campaigns and I don't have any kind of bombing force like that capable of launching a raid like that. So seeing two, three hundred bombers going into one hex in one turn was really cool. And I look forward to seeing more of that. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to transition over to some tracker stuff so we can look at the victory points and all that stuff. And then I'll show you what, what the penalties are for stacking limits and then we're going to end this video. Wait right here. Okay, guys, I don't know if you can even see this on your monitors. It might be a little too big for you. Um, but I'll show you basically where we're at. Turn 324. We got the ratio right here is 1.639 to 1. So the Japanese have a 1.6, let's round up, 1.64 to 1 ratio in points right now over the Allied player. And as I mentioned previously, if the Japanese player wants to like end the campaign on, on January 1943, they need four to one. So they are unfortunately nowhere close to being able to uh, checkmate Desert Wolf in this campaign. Um, that would be a tall order anyway. This guy's so good. But here's a, a bunch of the losses in a nutshell. There you go. Now, let's take a look at the manual. Okay, so here's the manual, and here's where it talks about stacking and overstacking. Uh, so I know it mentions island and atoll stacking because in the base game, the only real places that have stacking limits are going to be those islands and atolls in the, um, in the South Pacific, in the Pacific area that I mentioned. But in the game that they're playing, they've modified the, uh, the hex data so that you have stacking limits basically everywhere. So this does apply to their game. It just don't, don't get too hung up on the, um, 
don't get hung up on the verbiage of islands. So let me zoom in a bit here so you can read this. So basically, here are your penalties for overstacking, right? Fatigue and disruption to all units if the base is overstacked. Supply usage is increased for every 10% overstacking limit, right? The supply usage increases by an additional 20% for both sides. If an ATO has 6,000 man limit and a 12,000 man, and it has 12,000 man garrison, supply usage will increase from 100 to 300%. So this, there you go. Take a look at it. Over the long term, overstacking, uh, substitute the word ATO for any hex with too many men will hurt the defender badly. The attacker can successfully assault. So, uh, all right, you can read this for yourself. I don't need to read to you. But there you go. These are the penalties that you get for having units overstacked. So you really don't want to do that because it burns supply. It gives them disruption fatigue and it could just hurt you in the long run. So there you go. That's what overstacking limits are or penalties. And if you're curious about that yourself, you want to read it some more. It's section 8.9 in the manual. All right. I'm going to end this video now. If you have any questions about this campaign that I can ask DW for you. Or if you just have some comments about the video, I'd love to hear it. Uh, these are DW's uh, files, but I'm hosting this for him. So I'll be happy to act as an intermediary. But if you ever want to talk to him to yourself, come to our Discord and you can talk to him yourself. Catch you guys on the next one.